our subject is closeness to Christ. And we've come to this 10th verse in our studies in 2 Timothy. Paul bears up under all things, therefore I endure. And the Greek word translated endure means I stay under, I endure, or I bear up. Therefore, I bear up, I stay under, I endure all things, all the things that the Apostle Paul endured and suffered. Currently, he is in prison. Not like the last time he was in prison, in his own hired house, with a guard, but now chained to a wall, presumably in a damp and stinking dungeon. It's the imprisonment from which he will not be released. He will ultimately go to his execution at the hands of the Emperor Nero. He has suffered so many things, scourgings, whippings, beatings, mob violence, the constant plots against him of the Jewish leaders who pursued him everywhere they could, the false teachers, the Judaizers who followed him about and tried to wreck and damage the churches founded by him, all the concerns and the problems that he had, his own poor health, his long journeys, his shipwrecks. Therefore, I bear up under all things for the elect's sakes. What a surprise. For the elect's sakes. We're used to those passages where he tells us that he does everything for Christ. Indeed, there's one right here. Verse 3 in the exhortation to Timothy, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ for the one who has enlisted you. He does all things for Christ. He does all things by the enabling power and strength of Christ. He tells us elsewhere, he does all things for the word of God, for the gospel, that Christ may be published to all nations. That God's side in the dispute with man may be known far and wide that it is man's fault that he has fallen that he has sinned against the living God and that has brought in judgment and the curse but God is full of kindness and tender mercy and is ready to save millions billions through the Savior who will come publish these things throughout the world and the Apostle Paul bears up under all strain, all persecution, to publish Christ, that people may know about him and the love of God. But there he adds this, that he also bears all things for the elect's sakes. His mind is on the ransomed people of God. He doesn't know who they are, not until they're saved. He doesn't know how many there will be in each place that he visits, but he has them in mind. And oh, if we want to know how to endure for Christ, how to bear up as Christians when scorned, rejected, how to live for him, well, you think of the apostle and you think of the Christians in early times who did everything for Christ, for the honor of God, for the word of God, for the gospel, and now for the elect's sakes, for the sake of all those who through the work of the Spirit would come to repent of their sin and depend upon Christ and his atoning death on Calvary's cross and come to him and own him as the only Savior and find him and love him and live for him. Well, he has them in his mind. Why? Is he so full of sympathy for them? Well, you could reason because he knows what will happen to lost sinners who go to judgment unsaved. But more probably in his mind is this, they are my brothers and sisters. I shall inhabit eternity with them. They are loved by Christ. He has come and suffered and died for them. And I have the privilege of being his instrument, his messenger, to draw them in and gather them in. And so for their sake, 
the people for whom Christ died, the people who are loved on high, the people who will be saved, the people who will inhabit eternity. Paul will endure all things. And I dare say he has his mind on the future too. Long after he's called home, the people who will come to Christ through the witness of those who came through his, wit his testimony and his preaching and his words, his letters. He was aware that they were inspired of God. They were scripture. They made up the canon of scripture. How many texts would move hearts? How much reasoning? How many preachers would take these words and preach them? And the Holy Spirit would work and sinners would be saved. Perhaps he could in his mind look into the future and think of, well, the millions of people affected by the word of God. And so that enabled him to bear up. And so it does with us. This is a verse which has inspired pioneer missionaries down the centuries to think that there is an elect people who God will draw in in every town, in every country, in every place. And they would go to places where disease was rampant and Westerners would die quickly in all likelihood and they would do it, yes, for Christ's sake, for the gospel's sake, to publish everywhere the position of God and his mercy and his salvation and for the elect's sakes, for their sakes. So it is with us. Today, there will be those teaching Sunday school and teaching teenagers in the Bible classes, so many of them here and elsewhere. Well, you think how many may come to Christ now, maybe in the future, maybe years down the pathway of life, and they'll seek him and find him largely through the seed planted. And they will bring up their families and others will come too. And you do it for their sakes. And if it's difficult and you're exhausted and you're tired and you're having to visit to, to encourage them to come back through the evening hours in the week, well, you do it for Christ. You do it for the word, the publishing of the word. You do it for the sake of those who will be brought in to the kingdom of Christ. Pray for them. Think of them everywhere. Remember, be not afraid, said God to the Apostle Paul in Corinth. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, for I have much people in this place and that was all the encouragement and the strength that the Apostle Paul needed there in Corinth with all the rigors of that period of evangelism and ministry. So we look at these words and uh, we remember them. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Salvation now, of course. Oh, that their lives may be changed, that they'll find Christ, and they'll know his great love and the joy and peace that comes only from walking with him. And they'll understand the meaning of life. Do it for the elect's sakes. But then the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Why, salvation isn't complete until the day we die. Yes, it's a crisis experience. We are saved suddenly. Maybe that suddenly can be over a period of weeks or even months, who knows. But to come to Christ isn't lifelong. We seek him and find him and repent before him and we know him. But then, when we die, all sin is taken away. The great transformation takes place as we go as souls without bodies into the paradise of Christ, awaiting the final day of all time. Oh, dear friends, when that happens, we are completely saved, set free from all sin, filled with all knowledge and peace and happiness. 
but just to feel for the people of God. That's Christ-likeness. Christ came from heaven to earth to die for his elect people. And we just endure a so much smaller difficulty to live for him and to make him known. But we do it also for the elect's sakes. Look at verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. This is the fourth, as I'm sure you know, of five faithful sayings. Three of them are in 1 Timothy, one of them right here in 2 Timothy, one of them in the letter to Titus. The five faithful or reliable sayings of the pastoral letters. It is a faithful saying, a reliable saying. In fact, you could omit the italics there and the, the little word A in verse 11, and you get the structure of the Greek. Faithful is the first word in the Greek. Faithful is, we'd have to insert the verb, it isn't in the Greek. Faithful is the saying. So faithful becomes the emphasized word in the original. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Some people think that this is part of an ancient hymn, one of the first Christian hymns, these next two or three lines. But that's speculative. But anyway, the point is that the rock-solid faithful saying of verse 11 is built upon in the following verse to provide reasoning. And we'll look at it. Let's look at verse 11 first. Faithful is the saying, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Well, this is so close to Romans 6 and verses 5 and 6 that we cannot help seeing a parallel. Some people feel there is no parallel, but surely there must be. Romans 6, 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, and then we rise with him, we live with him. Verse 8 in Romans 6, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. And back to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. We died with Christ and in Christ. If we're truly converted, if we're believers, it is as though we died with him. It's simple, but that's the truth, the reality. He was our representative. He took my sin. He paid the price for me. When he died, my sin and guilt was on him. So I died with him. I died to the condemnation and judgment of God because he took away my punishment. I died to eternal death and hell because he suffered my burden. And if I have died with him, he rose to demonstrate, among other things, that he had fully successfully borne away the punishment of sin for all who would be redeemed. So as he rises, so I will receive life because I died in him. He's, he died for me and he secures my life eternally, my spiritual life now and my eternal life with the Lord. We died with him and if we died with him, we shall rise with him. We shall receive life from him. It is inevitable. You cannot not receive life with Christ if he bore away your sin. Why? God would no longer be just. If Christ 
paid the price for my guilt and sin. God cannot possibly, the Father cannot possibly order my condemnation and judgment. Christ has died and borne the punishment. If I died with him, I must live with him and for him and in him and through him. It follows inevitably. What an encouraging verse it is and statement. It is a faithful saying. Faithful, reliable is the saying. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Yes, but we died with Christ in a number of senses. When I repented of my sin and I yielded to Jesus Christ, my sin went on Calvary's cross. Also, in that death with Christ, I died to the old life and I received a new life. I died to the world and I determined to live for Christ and to bear up all the consequences to endure for him and to represent him and be his. May I ask the question, did you really die with Christ at what you think is your conversion? I mean this kindly and sympathetically, friend. Maybe somebody here had a light conversion. Do you mind my calling it that? A light, lightweight conversion. You believed in Christ. You kind of repented of your sin. But you never died with him. You didn't die to the old life. You didn't die to this world. So your sin wasn't really there. It was just a sentimental repentance. It was just a lightweight repentance. It wasn't part of true salvation. How do I know whether it was lightweight or whether it was real? I know because if it was real, at the same time, I died to the old life and I died to my sin and I died to this world. You know, the grand hymn, one of my favorite hymns and yours too, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. You know, there's a verse in that hymn, we don't have it in our hymn book, most modern hymn books don't have it, but there's a verse in that hymn that really does belong there. His dying crimson like a robe spreads o'er his body on the tree. Then am I dead to all the globe and all the globe is dead to me. That word globe is old fashioned. So the hymn, the verse is no longer in the books. Some people alter it a little and in doing so they lose a rhyming word, but maybe it's better. His dying crimson, like a robe, spreads o'er his body on the tree. Then am I dead to all the world, and all the world is dead to me. It's part of you dying with Christ on Calvary. You haven't died with Christ on Calvary unless your repentance was real. And if your repentance was real, you would have died to the world as well and your sin. And I say this and I elaborate upon this because there are increasing numbers of Christians today who have never died to the world. They haven't died to its pleasures, its profits or its honors. They're still very much in the world. In fact, you hear even churches saying, oh, we are culturally progressive, which means in our church you don't have to die to the old life and you don't have to die to the world. That's what it means. That means you haven't really died with Christ. Your sin was not on Calvary as far as we can tell. You've had a lightweight repentance. It wasn't meaningful. 
It didn't change your life. He didn't transform you and change you. So when we read this, read it very carefully, friends. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Yes, but did you die to the world? There are some people, and I mention this often, they've got the uh, earpiece in, and they cannot do without the world's music. Or if it isn't actually the world's music, it's a Christian substitute for the world's music. The words are a bit different, but the music is the same. It's the entertainment music of this vain and passing world. Dare I say this, because I don't make light of this, but dear friends, it's rather like being on methadone instead of heroin. That's the sort of Christian I am if I depend upon the drugs of this world, the musical entertainment drugs, the television, everything that goes with it. Why, it's just a slight, a substitute world I've got, which foolish Christian people are producing for me. But that's not truly dying with Christ. If we be dead with him, our guilt was on him, and our life in this world, for this world, drinking from the fountains of this world, has died too. And Christ is all to us. He is all. I don't want those things. I don't need those things. A guilty, vile, and helpless work. This is what I said at conversion. On thy kind arms I fall. Be thou my strength and righteousness, my Jesus and my all. Dear friends, make sure that the old life died and you died to the world and it was real repentance and you found the Lord and your life was changed and you're all together for him. Let's look on to verse 12 and pursue the reasoning. If we suffer we shall also reign with him. See the reasoning? If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If our sin and our old life and our worldly allegiance was on that cross of Calvary, we shall rise and live with him now and eternally. But then it follows, verse 12, if we suffer, and it's the same word that is translated in Jer in verse 10. If we bear up for him, hold up under the pressures of being a Christian, of being a witness, we shall also reign with him. It's moved on. Better to reign than to live. Of course, it's wonderful to have life. That's everything. To have spiritual life. But to reign, that's the heavenly part to reign with him. Can I explain that for a few moments? To reign with Christ. Surely when you read those words, you think to yourself, oh Lord, I don't want to reign. I just want to be there. I don't want to reign. If I am reigning, something will go wrong. Something will fail. You do the reigning, Lord. Well, that's precisely what happens. To reign with him is a figure. It means two things. First of all, it doesn't mean we have share his executive power, his executive rule. We don't want to do that. He alone is the Lord of glory and all-powerful and perfect and infallible. He reigns. But what do we do in reigning with him? It means we gladly and wholly concur. We gladly agree with everything which he has planned and done. We gladly endorse it. In fact, when we go to heaven, according to the imagery of the book of Revelation, in chapter 4, the four and twenty elders representing the church of both testaments, the people of God, cast their crowns at his feet before him. And that's what we do. We yield to him the full right to reign gladly. But to reign for us means this. 
We have no enemies. We have no sin. We have no grief, no fatigue, no unhappiness, sadness. It means we're free from all that. We have the privileges of reign without the responsibility. When we reign with him, we have pure and wonderful happiness and peace throughout eternity. But we've cast our crowns at his feet. All true believers bear up for him. If we suffer, bear up under, we shall also reign with him. Forgo earthly rewards, live for him. But then look at the second part of verse 12. This is so solemn. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Literally, if we contradict him, he also will contradict us before his Father. We read it, the words of Christ, they're in mind here in Matthew 10. If we deny him, but it's not only a matter of denying the doctrine of salvation. It doesn't, by the way, this is believers. If we deny him, the Apostle Paul doesn't have in mind unbelievers here. He has in mind people who have a profession of faith. But they're not really saved. Because in some very permanent and serious way, they deny him. Maybe they, in the end, deny the saving doctrines of the atonement and so on. Maybe they deny him in his commands. Oh, I've repented of my sin once. I came to Jesus Christ and trusted in him. I believe these things. I believe the confession of faith. I believe all the doctrines, and I can rehearse them to you. I'm very well instructed, very well taught. I claim to be a fully instructed Calvinist. I can still deny Christ, but when he tells me to come away from this world and all that is distinctly worldly and to live for him and to put him first, and not just worship once a week and not live as a believer, should, and live for this world's pleasures, I deny him. I say I've come to him, but when he says, my child, this is how you will live, I say, no, Lord, no, Lord. I am culturally progressive. I will slap that down and contradict it and deny it and do the opposite. Be careful, dear friends. That's in denial too. Listen to the words. If we suffer, if we bear up for him, we shall also reign with him. If we contradict him, he also will contradict us. And it's repeated. Oh, you think, I'll cling on to verse 13. Verse 13 tells me it'll be all right after all. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. How do you read that verse, friends? I know people who read it to mean the opposite of what it plainly does mean. I say, oh, if I'm faithless, in other words, it's the same person. I've contradicted him. I won't live the life his way. I'll do it entirely a different way, my own way. If we believe not, actually you could translate that much better. If we are faithless, yet he abideth faithful. Oh, this is how I read it, you say. If I'm faithless, it doesn't matter. He'll still be faithful to me. That's wrong. That's not what the verse says. Look at it carefully. Eternity may depend upon this. If I am faithless, or if I contradict him, he continues faithful to his warning. That's what it means. To his warning. 
that we will be contradicted or denied. So if I deny him or contradict him or am faithless and disloyal in a major permanent way, this isn't just backsliding, then he will be faithful to the warning he's given to deny me. It is a very solemn verse. Make sure you understand it correctly. Of course he will be faithful to his warning. He cannot contradict himself. He cannot overlook our sin. He cannot warn us one minute and then say, oh, it doesn't matter the next. I didn't mean that. He is truth. He is God. So let's read it correctly. Verse 13. If we believe not, if we're faithless, if we contradict him, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself or what he has said. So don't be like those foolish people who read the opposite meaning into the verse. If I am faithless, aha, uh -huh, doesn't matter. He'll be faithful to me. No, he'll be faithful to his word, to his warning. And then we have time to go on to verse 14. And it tells us something about the ministry of Timothy. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. This is a very um, important verse. Your ministry, says Paul to Timothy, must constantly remind people about these things. Well, some of these things are negative. And they include sound doctrine in chapter 1. This goes back to chapter 113. The things which Timothy must remind them of. All the things that the apostle has said. Hold fast the form of sound words. Constantly remind them to honor the scriptures and to learn it and keep the doctrines. Of course. Keep the heart, chapter 1 verse 14, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Keep what God has given you, your redeemed life, the truth of the gospel, your commission to represent him. Keep the heart, keep yourself sincere. Timothy must constantly remind them of that. Be loyal, remember good work, Verse 16, the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Remember good works. Remember to seek strength, chapter 2, verse 1, from the Lord. Remember to provide for the next generation, verse 2 of, ver of chapter 2, the things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall teach and preach to others. That's so important. Remember to live from verses four to six like a soldier, an athlete, a farmer. We've considered all those. Chapter two, verse 11. Die with Christ, die to sin and the world. So there, in verse 14, of these things, we may say of all these things, Put them in remembrance. What a ministry. The model ministry of Timothy. He's to be doctrinal. He's to be practical. He's to be devotional. And we see it all in this series of verses. You can't just be doctrinal as a preacher. You must be practical. You must be an exhorter. I was talking about this a few weeks ago. You must also be devotional and lift up hearts and draw people to Christ and show them his greatness and his kindness and his glory. You have to have a warm in ministry and a warning ministry and a doctrinal ministry. Don't waste time with the false teachers. 
second half of verse 14, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Tremendous word in the Greek, translated quite rightly, subverting of the hearers. It's the very word that we have in the English language in a different form, catastrophe. The Greek says something like this, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the catastrophizing of the hearers. That's literally, more or less, what it says. In other words, the overthrowing of the understanding of the hearers. Don't waste time with the false teachers. Reject them. Don't let it in. There's a lot about that in First Timothy. But it gives us time, if I go straight to verse 15, to conclude with some thoughts on this verse. And it, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Study. The moderns will translate it something like be diligent. That's good. Actually, the Greek has the idea of speed. Literally, it's something like be speedy to show thyself. But be diligent, study. Be eager would be good. Be eager to show thyself approved unto God. Why? I must end with this verse and talk about it for a few moments because it's another aspect of what motivated Paul. And he passes it also under inspiration to Timothy and to us. He does everything because he's indebted to Christ for Christ's sake. He does everything and endures everything he endures to publish Christ, to make it known to as many people as possible what God has done to redeem and to save. He does everything he does and stands up to everything for the elect's sakes. Don't miss that out. And now we find a final motivating factor for Paul. He does everything as one who seeks approval from God for everything. He presents himself and shows his working to God. He will see. I want to do what he wants me to do. I want to be approved. That's here in this 15th verse. Study, be eager, be diligent to show thyself. Present yourself approved unto God. Your driving instructor is watching you. Be careful that you remember to comply with all the things you've been told. Oh, that's a feeble figure. Your Lord is watching you. Your Savior is watching you. His eye is upon you. He suffered and died for you. He purchased you. He plans for you and your eternal glory. He refines you, will come to your aid. Oh, do what you do to please him. I so preach, says the Apostle and Timothy, you must do this, he says, as one who presents yourself for the approval of God, to please him to do just what he has bidden you to do. The preacher must think of that. He settles down at his desk. He may get carried away by the passage and very interested in it. He does his preparation. Is it entering in his mind, I want in this message to so do it and present it and honor it as to please my Lord, my Savior, God, my Father. I am under scrutiny. I don't want to be put to shame in the last day. For 20 years, for 30, 40 years, you were not diligent. To hear the voice say, I'm going to save you and bless you and bring you home. But just in that spasm, that last moment, you were not diligent. You preached all sorts of things. They were sound, but you weren't thinking of what you were doing. 
of these things put them in remembrance. Then verse 15, study, be diligent to present yourself approved unto God, a workman, not a showman. Too many showmen in the pulpits, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. No cause for shame when God tests you. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Can I close with this? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Everybody jumps on the King James Version. That's wrong, they say. It should be cutting straight. <laughs> I've rather looked into this, and I think the King James translators are right, actually. But whether you say rightly dividing or cutting straight, let's be sensible, it amounts to the same thing. They say, oh, the Apostle Paul is talking about a carpenter. And maybe he's building a house and he's got to cut the timber members so that it isn't a misshapen thing that will collapse, but everything fits and can be strong and stable. Others say, no, no, he's probably talking about a stonemason, cutting the stones, splitting them, getting everything. Well, whether you're dividing stone or whether you're cutting it straight, it's all much the same. However, there's a lot to be said for rightly dividing. Because I think what is most likely is that the Apostle Paul was thinking about his own standby occupation in this picture. Yes, carpenter if you like, a workman who doesn't need to be exposed or ashamed, rightly dividing, cutting straight the wood, the stone, or what about the tent cloth? The Apostle Paul was an intellectual, but all Jewish intellectuals, all Jewish men, had to learn a standby trade. And his was tent making. They made tents, we're told, of goat's hair, sometimes camel's hair, if you could afford that. Sometimes leather. The Roman officers all went in leather tents. They think they were very steep ridge tents, but we haven't time for that. There were various things. Tents made from black sheep's wool, which was, I read, supposed to be tougher and more suitable. But you didn't have great mills producing material so wide it was woven in strips and probably the tent maker wove the strips too, weaving as well as cutting it and stitching it. And tents, they have to be very cleverly done. They might be awnings, they might be coverings across the patio of a, or the inner courtyard of some of the buildings of those days. Tents for travelers, of course, for all kinds of things. Tents were in great demand. And the way they were constructed, very big ones, small things, you had to cut the pieces so that everything would fit and there would be strength. And when the ropes were attached and the guys, there was strength even in the way the intention provided by the design and structure of the tents. Rightly dividing the word of truth. The apostle transfers this illustration to handling the word of God. Yes, there are so many things to consider in preaching the word of God. You've got to preach the gospel from it. You've got to preach the doctrines from it. You've got to be an exhorter and a comforter. You've got to preach the glory of God magnify him and lift him up. You've got to be very careful with illustrations, by the way. Illustrations are good, but they can completely distract. I often say this to people, but if you preach too many illustrations, all the heads come up for the illustrations and nobody takes much notice or remembers anything else. The word of God itself has compelling power. We illustrate where, where we have to not just to entertain, because we're to rightly divide the word of truth. We've got to examine ourselves constantly. Am I covering all the topics, all the themes? Am I a one-theme preacher, a two-theme preacher? When I've got many themes, doctrines, applications in the word of God. Well, that's enough for us this morning. 
a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Closeness to Christ. We are close to Christ not by imagining feelings, but by obeying and honoring. And the particular things that we see in this passage as we go through it are the things that motivated the apostle. And I commend them to you to remember.